All right, everyone. Well, Nehemiah, uh, last week we had, uh, of course, in our study through the book of Nehemiah, Arise, Rebuild, Defend. Um, uh, I, I love being in the Old Testament. It's a sad thing when uh, so many churches uh, nowadays are not in the Old Testament. They're not teaching from the Old Testament. And yet the reality is, is that it's all the Word of God, Old and New Testament uh, alike. It's all the Word of God. In fact, uh, Christ quoted, uh, obviously, uh, from the Old Testament, quoted extensively from the book of Deuteronomy, from the book of um, uh, Isaiah, uh, and others. And so, you know, if the Lord is in the Old Testament, so too should we. So uh, again, uh, Nehemiah, arise, rebuild, and defend uh, is uh, the theme that we see consistently through uh, this book study that we're in. Let's begin here. Uh, last week, I know that we just had started. We kind of closed out chapter 8, and we uh, had begun to get into chapter 9. Uh, let's just go over here, these first, beginning in verse 1, these first three verses, just briefly. It says, Now on the 24th day of the month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and sackcloth and with dust on their heads. And then those of Israelite lineage separated themselves from all foreigners, and they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for one-fourth of the day, and another fourth they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God." As we were sharing last week that, uh, and closing out chapter 8, that the people uh, were fasting, or not fasting, rather they were feasting. They were celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles and how God had tabernacled uh, among them. By the way, side note, you know that God tabernacles with us as well as Christians. In fact, in even a more unique and more profound way than he did then in Old Testament times. Times because we read in God's word that uh, for those of us who know the Lord and walk with the Lord and we're filled with the Holy Spirit, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. In other words, the dwelling of the Holy Spirit. You know, when I grew up, I don't know about you, when I grew up, I always thought, you know, I'm here and God is somewhere there, up there, uh, somewhere. That was just my, my view of God. My view of God was that he was, uh, that he was very distant and that God uh, was a very angry God. That was just my view of him uh, at the time. And I came to realize after I came to the Lord that God is very near to us, in fact, as Christians, that we, again, that we are filled with the Holy Spirit, that he dwells not only with us and among us, but he fills us with his very presence. And so the people were celebrating that Feast of Tabernacles, and we gave much explanation to that last week, and part of that was the feasting and the celebrating and the remembering of, of what God had done and the goodness of the Lord. And it was such a wonderful and exciting time. But the people ended up going from, from uh, fast or from feasting rather, which we read about last week, and to this week where they're in a place of fasting. And as we had shared, why did they go from this place of, of celebration, from this place of, of feasting to now a place of fasting? The important thing to note was that they were consistently in the Word. The Word was constantly being read to the congregation, to the masses, to the people, you see. And as the people were in the Word and they were studying the Word and reading the Word, and there was ex um, uh, explanation given to what God's Word was saying, the people realized something very important. They realized that God is a very holy and very righteous God. And they realized that they weren't honoring the Lord. They saw that they weren't living for him as, as we are called to do. As scripture says, in him we live and move and have our being. 
And I believe that the people very clearly realized that they weren't really living for God. That every step they take and every move that they made as a people wasn't done with the Lord at the forefront of their lives and of their thoughts. They weren't living, they weren't moving, they weren't having their being and their existence and their, and their days filled with the things of the Lord and the presence of the Lord. You see, here's the thing for Christians, is that being a Christian is not a part of who we are. Being a Christian is not something that we do. It's who we are to the core if we are filled with the Holy Spirit of God, you see? So we don't leave being a Christian when we walk out the door of a church, you see? We don't, we don't stop being a Christian when we put down our Bible or, or are, not, are not in that time, that prayer closet with the Lord. Rather, we have the Lord with us throughout every moment of every day. We carry the presence of the Lord in our lives, you see? And the people were recognizing the more that they were in his word. Can you turn that up a degree, please? A little cool. The people were realizing that they weren't living for God. And they weren't walking with the Lord, you see. And it brought them to this place where they recognized they needed to get right with God. And they recognized that they needed to get on their faces before God. They needed to call upon his name, you see. They needed to repent of sin. They needed true and lasting biblical change in their lives. I believe that's why we're here this evening, because we recognize that. We recognize that we need true and lasting biblical change in our lives. We recognize that we need more of the Lord, that there is an, an, an increase of, of the Lord in our lives and a an decrease of self, you see? And so this was the place that the people were in. There was amazing change taking place amongst the people that were there. And they were beginning to really recognize a need for true, wholehearted devotion to the Lord. And so it brings us to uh, beginning in verse 4 here. And by the way, uh, just so you know, this right here, beginning in verse um, uh, what is it, verse 5, or the second half of verse 5, all the way through uh, verse thirty. Eight of this chapter, this whole chapter, is that this is, we find before us here, the longest recorded prayer in the Word of God. You see, it, that's why it, it really interests me how, how many times we, we might go to, to the book of Psalms, right? And we read the, the various prayers that are there and all that's there. We go to the book of Psalms, we go maybe somewhere in the, in the gospel according to John, and yet the longest prayer in all of God's word is right here in the book of Nehemiah, you see? And so what a wonderful uh, jewel and treasure that we have for us here. I was reading last night in part, and then somehow I pushed the wrong button, and I, I lost it all and couldn't find it again. There was this uh, interesting article uh, on the computer about uh, these lost treasures and ships uh, with all these treasures that have been found uh, through the ages and, and uh, how uh, one of them, the, they estimate the value was at something like 17 billion with a B uh, worth of treasure that was found. And, yet, and I'm in awe just reading about all these gold ingots that have ever been found in the world and, and all of this. And yet I think to myself, man, all of that stuff just doesn't hold a candle to the treasures that we find that are within God's word, the treasures in his word. And so verses uh, four through six, just by way of outline, if you're uh, a note taker, uh, I'm definitely a note taker. I just don't retain things that well unless I write it down. Um, but in verses four through six, we see revealed for us the God of of all glory, the God of all glory. Verses 7 through 30, the God of all goodness, the God of all goodness. And then 
uh, if we should uh, get there uh, this evening, verses 31 through 38, the God of all grace. The God of all grace. So he's the God of all glory, of all goodness, and of all grace that we find here in his word. So let's look now, uh, beginning in verse 4. Then uh, Jeshua, Bani, uh, Kadmael, uh, Shebaniah, uh, Bunai, uh, Sherebiah, uh, Bani, uh, again, and uh, uh, Chenanai, if I'm saying that one's name correctly, stood on the stairs of the Levites and cried out with a loud voice to the Lord their God. And the Levites and Jeshua, uh, Kadmael, uh, Bani, uh, Hash, Abaniah, uh, Sherebiah, um, uh, Hudajah, Hudajah uh, Shi and uh, Peth Ahiah said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You know, I'm so glad that most of us in this room have names like uh, Kurt and John and, and Steve and, and uh, you know, Mary Beth and, and all of that. Simple, simple names, but... Nonetheless, um, we see in verse 6, it says, You alone are the Lord, you have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all, the host of heaven worships you. So, um, we read here just a, a couple of these names. This one in verse 4, uh, Shebaniah, uh, we understand to possibly mean turn, pray, O Yahweh. Turn, pray, O Yahweh. And uh, Bunai, in short, or a short rather, for uh, Benaya, which means Yahweh has built. And then uh, Kenanai, Kenanai, short for Kenaniah means Yahweh strengthens. And it's interesting that we find in all of these names uh, Yahweh, and we've, we find turn and pray, we find Yahweh has built, Yahweh strengthens. What, what wonderful heritage uh, we find just within uh, these names of these men that are uh, listed here before us. It says, your glorious name, your glorious name. Literally, this literally means the name of your glory. So the name of your glory, and it comes, by the way, from the root that means weighty, or by extension means honored. So when we're reading here your glorious name, what they're saying is they're coming before God, they're acknowledging him for who he is, right? That's worship, acknowledging him for who he is. And they're saying here, Lord, your name is weighty. Your name, how, how, how do we even describe when we call upon you, Lord, when we seek your face, Lord, how do we even describe your name? You ever find yourself in that place? You're just before the Lord and, and you're just like, oh God, I, I don't even know how to, how to share with you the, the, the love the, uh, that is in my heart right now. I don't even know how to, how to put to words how much you have moved me how much you have worked in my life and how awesome you are. Words cannot describe. I fall short of finding words that are descriptive of how amazing my Lord is. And here we see, as they're calling upon your glorious name, coming from that root, which means weighty. Oh Lord, your name is so weighty. Your name is just so, there's so much to it. How can I even describe or put into uh, words adequately? Just amazing. So blessed be your glorious name, again, which is exalted above all, and blessing and praise. You look again in verse 6. You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, 
the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. God's made all of these things that we read about, all of these wonderful, wonderful things. You know, when we think about the things that God has made, one of them we see when we look at the night sky, some of the nights during the course of, of a month, we'll look at, night, at the night and we'll see the moon. That moon, that light that governs the night, that, that thing that does not give light in and of itself, but it is a light reflector. It's reflecting the light of the sun. Now, you know, if the moon was much larger than it is, or if the moon was nearer to the earth than it is, the huge tides uh, that would ultimately uh, result from that would uh, absolutely overflow onto the lowlands uh, and erode the mountains. It's a fact. If the continents were leveled then, it's estimated that the water would cover the entire surface of the depth of over or to the depth, rather, of over a mile. Amazing. Just if the moon were a little larger or a little closer. Now, think about this. If the earth were not tilted at a 23, uh, uh, d- tilted at 23 degrees on its axis, okay, but rather on a 90 de- uh, degree angle um, in reference to the sun, we wouldn't have four seasons, Okay. And the four seasons are very important because without the four seasons, life would soon uh, not be able to exist on the earth. The poles would lie uh, in eternal uh, twilight and water vapor from the oceans would be carried by the wind towards both the north and the south, okay? Freezing when it moves closer or close enough rather to the poles, In time, think about this, in time, huge continents of snow and ice would pile up in the polar regions, leaving most of the earth a dry desert. The oceans would eventually disappear and rainfall would cease. The accumulated uh, weight of ice at the poles would cause the equator to bulge. And as a result, the Earth's rotation would drastically change. You know, I think it's so easy to take for granted the wonderful things that God has done in his creation, in the very tilting of the axis, or of the axis, or in the very size or location of the moon is so important and so strategic. And so many of the things, all of the things that God has made, he has made with a plan and with a purpose. Now think to yourself, if God looks at such details of things like that, Or if God looks at such of the details, such as the composition of the air. Or if God looks at such details as to the composition of of water here on earth, or so many other things. Think about the detail that God has in making you. Think of the detail in what God has done. I don't even believe we fully comprehend. I know for a fact I don't fully comprehend God's creative, I don't even know what to say, genius or whatever we want to call it, in constructing you and me and how every part comes together in, it, in, in our body and does its share, even things that we don't even completely know or understand today. And so why do I even uh, bring this uh, to mention or, or, or highlight this is because it says, again, you alone are the Lord. You made heaven and the heaven of heavens with all their host. And so they didn't even have the understanding that we have today through uh, science and, and whatnot. You see, we, have, we can look back and we still have so much to learn. We are learning so much uh, today in a lot of ways and in the areas of quantum computing and, and a number of different things. Some of these things are absolutely scary, if you want to ask me. But, um, but we've learned a lot of things. And we can look back and we can say, oh my, 
And if these people back then in the time of Nehemiah were in so much in awe of God and they didn't even understand some of those technicalities of just a couple little things and there's billions of those things that we could talk about in God's creative design. And they didn't even understand those things and they worshiped him and they praised him how much more you and I when we look back and we say, wow, look at what God has done. Look at what God has done. You know, when I was thinking about this is when I was in uh, California the other day, a few days ago, and Kathy and I are there and we're at the beach there in San Diego, my favorite place right there in San Diego. It's always beautiful. It's, it can be storming, thunder, lightning, and San Diego, the, the beach at San Diego is beautiful. It's never a bad, I have never had a bad day on Pacific Beach, ever. And our favorite thing is to go out there and we just sit out there, we get our feet a little wet, kind of play around in the sand, all of that, but the favorite thing is towards the end of the day, watching the sun go down. I'm not kidding you. I, I, I've been there a number of times over the years, and just being there again um, uh, over the past few days, I can't even tell you how many hundreds of pictures I took of the sunset because I'm, I'm constantly in awe of it. I mean, every angle and the way that the, that the sun is and the way that the clouds are and, and just the, the, the glow and, the, and, and how it, and how it uh, comes up, uh, across the, the ripples of, of the water and how each wave is unique and different. It, it's just absolutely amazing to me. But you know what one of the coolest things is? And I don't know if you've ever been there, if you've ever experienced this uh, there or anywhere else is that on, a, on an evening where there's no clouds and everyone can clearly see the sun as it's setting, and then you see it right there, and it's just barely about, it, just about to go down, and then it completely just, in a moment, it's gone like that, right? And the whole beach erupts in applause, and you hear, oh! Believers and non-believers alike, I look at my wife and I say, showing nightly, God is faithful from the rising of the sun to the time that it goes down. God is faithful and God is good. And you just look upon the goodness of God. And so many of the people, I bet, don't even recognize the fact that, you know what? God did that. God made it to be. God ordained it to be. The sun is one of those heavenly bodies that we read about in God's word and how the people just erupt like that. And you just hear it just go all across the beach. And they're clapping. The, the firehouse that is right there. You would think these guys, they see the sunset every night of the week. And how many times these guys, they come out and they stand right there in a line and they've got to watch it just one more time. Think about that. These are the kinds of things that I think about because I think to myself, wow, how we're in awe of something that we could very easily take for granted, right? I mean, how many of us have seen the fountains at Bellagio, right? Beautiful. <laughs> Doesn't compare to God's sunset doesn't compare to the sound of the ocean, doesn't compare to the things that God has made and God has created. And so I say these things. When was the last time we just looked up at the sky at night and we just were in awe of what God has made? When was the last time we looked at our children, or our grandchildren, our husband, wife? When was the last time we were in awe? Wow, Lord, Look at what you have made. And look at, Lord, at how you have blessed me with what you have made, that I get to enjoy what you have made. You see, we have so much that we can pray about and seek God about, don't we? And so in verses 7 through 30, the God of all goodness, the God of all goodness. Let's look here in verse 7. You are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name 
Abraham. Now, Abram uh, means the father is exalted, and the name Abraham means the father of a multitude. And God changed the man's name because God did a work in changing the man's heart. Names change when when that direction in one's life changes. We saw going from Jacob, which means heel catcher, to when God changed his name to Israel. The name Israel means governed by God. Think about that. He went from, from being heel catcher and, and, and deceiver and you know, all of these kinds of, kinds of things to a man that was governed by God when he's truly surrendered to the Lord in his life. You see, from, from Saul of Tarsus to Paul and so many others, that God brings about that change in their lives. And, and it says here, again, that you are the Lord God who chose Abraham. It's God who chooses. God has the right to choose. Choice is always the action and the right of God. It's always his right. It's always his action to choose. And to challenge that, is to challenge the very authority of God himself. One may ask, is it right for God to have the right to choose? Is it right? Is it fair? But God is God, isn't he? And challenging his right is to say that God doesn't know what's best in his right to choose. The reality is, is that we are all sinners and created beings by God why God would have favor on any one of us is amazing to me. Well, God doesn't have favor on me. Uh, yes, he does. Yes, he does. Think about this. You're clothed here tonight. You've likely been fed at some point today. I believe everyone in this room has a roof upon, uh, uh, over their head and a bed to sleep on. Has God not treated us so well? Does God treat us as our sins deserve? No, he does not. And how many times that we ask the question, God, why do, bad, why, why do bad things happen to me? Like we've said before is the wrong question. The question is, is God, why does anything good happen to me? Why does anything good happen? I don't deserve the goodness of God. I don't. Before a righteous God, do I deserve the goodness of God? No, I don't. But God is so good. He's the God of all goodness and showers it down upon me. And he makes his choice. He makes his choices. Verse 8, it says, You found his heart faithful before you and made a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Girgashites, uh, to give it to his descendants. You have performed your words. For you are righteous. God performs his words. You know, God keeps his word. We should, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if we kept our word, right? If we, could, if we actually kept our word. But God keeps his word. When God says that I'll never leave you nor forsake you, I'm going to tell you something. This is really deep. You know what that means? That God will never leave you nor forsake you. It's really that, it's really that simple. You see, God's word is so deep, it's amazing, and yet it's so simplistic. It's so simplistic that any of us can understand and receive just those basic truths of God's word. And so, again, he performs his words, and it says that, for you are righteous. For you are righteous. He's the God of all goodness. And yes, he is righteous. He is righteous and he is um, he's righteous because, he's, because he is God, because he's good, because it's, it's who he is. And even now, even now I have no, no righteousness of my own in my own flesh, in my own flesh. Yet I thank God for God's righteousness. I thank God for God's goodness 
to me. Uh, we see here, if you look on the screen, 1 John chapter 1, verse uh, 9, it says if we confess our sins, that he's faithful. There we go again. We see God's faithfulness. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The reality is, is that we're not righteous in ourselves. Scripture says no one is righteous. No, not one. You see? So how can we have any righteousness? In fact, we see that it says in the book of Genesis that Abraham was a man that was righteous before God. God accounted Abraham's faithfulness to God as righteousness, you see. It was his faithfulness to God. But where does even the faith come from? It comes from God as well. Even the faith comes from the Lord. And we're not righteous in and of ourselves, but God is faithful. God is just. God wants to forgive us our sins. God wants to cleanse us from the filth of sin and from all unrighteousness so that the only righteousness that we do have is in our connection to him, in his righteousness. He is our righteousness, you see. So in verses 9 through 11, verses 9 through 11, it says, you saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry by the Red Sea. You showed signs and wonders uh, against Pharaoh, against all his servants, and against all the people of his land, for you knew that they acted proudly against them. So you made a name for yourself as it is to this day, and you divided the sea before them so that they went through the midst of the sea on the dry land, and their persecutors you threw into the deep as a stone into the mighty waters." This was something that God himself had done. In fact, even in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 29, it says, By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were what? Were drowned, you see? So how did they pass through the Red Sea? How did they do it? What does God's word say? They did it by what? By faith. They did it by faith. See, Scripture says again that without faith it's impossible to please God because we must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek Him. Faith is such an important element in our lives. In fact, uh, faith is the element in which we come and put our trust in the Lord ultimately is by faith in Him. The people had to act on faith in the Red Sea crossing. We too have to act in faith in the things that God calls us and tells us to do. The Lord has for many of us, or all of us perhaps in this room, let us out of our own Egypt of sorts, Egypt synonymous with worldliness. When you see Egypt mentioned in the Word of God, it's always synonymous with worldliness. It's a picture of the world. In other words, worldliness. It's a picture of self-determination and leaving God out of the equation in one's life. And God has so chosen to deliver you and I out of our own Egypt, you see, and into ultimately leading us to the promised land. And yet between point A and point B, point A being that Egypt, that worldliness, point B being the promised land with the Lord. Oh, God has, is, has and is doing such a work in our lives. And we see faith as the necessary element. Again, if by, without faith it's impossible to please God, then how can I be pleasing to God? With faith. With faith. What does that mean? That means trusting God. What does that mean? That means just letting go and saying, Lord, have your way in my life. But let's be honest with ourselves. We don't always want God's way, do we? We don't always want God's way. We think we do. We pray about it. We say to God, God, have your, you know, Lord, not, not my will, but, but thy will be done. And then we tend to question when God's will is done, when God brings us to a place, wait a minute, God, I thought you were taking us from this place and bringing us to the promised land. What's this? What's this big wall of water here in the way? In fact, as God was delivering them from uh, uh, Egypt to the promised land, ultimately, he brought them not only to that place where 
There was the water before them, but they were literally sandwiched in there by the mountains, the way the mountains were formed. They were, if you would say, literally stuck between a rock and a hard place. And then the Egyptian army comes in hot pursuit. Have you ever been in that place before? You think to yourself, wait a minute, I thought I heard from you, God. Why is it so difficult? Because God allows those difficulties and God allows those trials and tribulations and and persecutions and, and all of those kinds of things to come into our lives to develop us. They develop us, the character To the core of who we are as a Christian, God chooses to develop. But those things are necessary. Those pains and, and difficulties and the like in life are necessary elements that he brings ultimately into play. God never promised that there wouldn't be hardship. God never promised them that it was going to be an easy trip from where they were to where God wanted them to be. And God in his word, and we preach a very false word. If we say, come to Christ and everything will be better. How many times have you maybe heard those things before? You, you accept Jesus and, you, and everything's going to be great in life. No, you accept Christ. You come to the Lord and you're saved. Yes. Absolutely. And you can have that peace that surpasses understanding and your hope can be in the Lord. But that does not mean that everything that goes on in the world around us is going to be easy because we live in a fallen world. We have dual citizenship. We are citizens, or maybe some of you have even more than it, but we have citizenship here in America, or let's even say citizenship here with the world. But as Christians, we're citizens of heaven. You see? And so we have that citizenship there, but we currently live in a fallen world, you see? But God can use these things to develop us and to grow us and to strengthen us as the body of Christ. You know, uh, the other thing to mention here is there's been so much archaeological uh, evidence uh, that's been found uh, which really uh, just goes alongside this whole Red Sea crossing. It's really incredible, um, and uh, maybe one day we'll, we'll share it, but, but not tonight. Um, but verses 12 through 15, moreover, it says, You led them by day with a cloudy pillar, and by night with a pillar of fire, to give them light on the road which they should travel. And it says that you came down also on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them just ordinances and true laws. Good statutes and commandments, you made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them, commanded them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses your servant. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought them water out of the rock for their thirst and told them to go in to uh, possess the land which you had sworn to give them. And so God makes so very clear with man ultimately what he expects in giving man those precepts and statutes and laws God makes so clear what he expects. And it's for man, for man's own good as well. God's law. Now, verse 15, we see in verse 15, the reality is that they never even, uh, to this day, never even to this day, as it says here, uh, told them to go in and possess the land. They've never possessed the entire land. Israel to this day has never possessed all of the land to the borders which God outlined for them to possess. Why not? Did God not keep his word? You bet God keeps his word, but man has not been faithful to do man's part. You see, how many times in our prayer life do we pray, God, change this, God, do this, and I I gotta catch myself in my prayer sometimes. I really do. I pray, uh, this is a prayer. God, give me strength. And I got to think about that for a second. Wait a minute. God has given me strength. God has given me his Holy Spirit. I may not understand 
everything of the Lord and everything of, of his spirit and everything of his word. But God has given me strength. Oh, he's given me strength. The failure is not on God to give. The failure is on my part to put it into use, to put it into practice, you see, in my life. To take the things that God has given me and to use them, you see. The fact is, is they failed to possess all the land. The fact is, is that they failed to trust God in the battle. The reality is, is that they got cold feet. They got cold feet. They got comfortable. Well, wait a minute. We're blessed. We're out of Egypt. We're in this land flowing of milk and honey. We've got all these good things. Everything's great. We defeated this one. We defeated that one. Jebusites, parasites, and you know, every other kind of ites out there. And it's all good. We're good to go. We're good to go. You see? And I got to ask myself this. How many times as Christians do we think we're good to go? Hey, I go to church once a week, or I go to church. Hey, if you're really radical in America today, <laughs> you go to church twice a week. Woohoo! You know, you're a Jesus freak. I'm good to go. I'm good to go. You know, hey, I serve in my one little area here, but more than that, well, hey, I, I did my part. I'm good to go, you know. And I think to myself, how many times have we failed to take hold of what the totality of what God has for us, of what God has for me. How much more amazing can my marriage be? If I asked my wife, she would probably say a lot more amazing than it is. <laughs> no. I, I mean, we've been married 30 years. We met in church. God literally gave me a sign that I was the marrier. <laughs> uh, amazing. It, it's been wonderful. And yet I have to think to myself, am I fully embracing everything that God has for me in my marriage? Am I fully embracing everything God has for me in taking not only steps of faith, but in times leaps of faith? Or do I just settle in for a comfortable Christianity? Comfortable Christianity. Yet when we look at our brothers and sisters in North Korea, there ain't no comfortable Christianity there. When you say you're a Christian, it's a death sentence. At best, at best, labor camps that are close to, in some ways, similar to concentration camps and the, the tortures and awful, inhumane things that take place in those places. When you say you're a Christian in many parts of the world today, like in Syria, in parts of Turkey, in the Sudan, in Yemen, you say you're a Christian, you might as well go out and dig a grave. There's a cost for discipleship of following Christ. And the reality is, let's be honest, guys, in America, it's become a comfortable Christianity. I don't think it's always going to be that way because I see what God's word says is coming, you say. And between now and then, I don't know what's going to happen. But we do hear and we read in the newspapers every day of the winds of war in this country. We do. The drumbeat of war is beating, and it's beating loud. And I don't say that to scare anyone. It's a reality, you know? And we, we, we and I, we get into our comfortable lives, and, and I get, I'm going to go out, and I'm going to mow my lawn, and, and you know, we're going to you know, do this thing, or go to Chili's and get a bite to eat, and, and have a good time, and, and live life, and I understand that. I understand that. But the reality is, is that things are going on in the world around us that have to happen, preceding the second coming of Jesus Christ, you see. Very important. And I've got to ask myself, have I gotten lazy? Have I gotten lethargic? Have I gotten just so comfortable that I'm not pushing the envelope in my walk any longer? That I'm not allowing myself to be challenged? And how do I allow myself to be challenged? Well, I have to take my eyes off of me, and I have to take a step or at times a leap of faith. I think they got to the point, my friends, where they didn't want to be challenged anymore. You see, that's what we're reading about when it says you told them to go in and possess the land, but we know from history that they didn't possess all of it. By the way, where we see in the news every single day, the nation of Israel is constantly in the news. You know that 
area called the Gaza Strip. That's supposed to be under their 100% control. They gave it up. Land for peace. Has it worked? No. It never works when we try and do things on our own efforts. It never works when, when we don't just take God at his, at his word. Look at the mess in the West Bank, okay? It's a mess. Is it working, what they have done in those regards? No. No, it doesn't at all, you see. And so ultimately, for ourselves as well, we too need to trust in the Lord. And we're going to wrap this up here in just a couple minutes. So verses 16 through 17, we'll cover and we'll end on this this evening. It says, but they and our fathers acted proudly, hardened their necks, and did not heed your commandments. They refused to obey, and they were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them but they hardened their necks. And in the rebellion, they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. But you, O oh God, ready, are you ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them. Mm. They were backslidden in heart. They were backslidden in heart, the people were. And returning to their old ways, they, they would ultimately end up paying the price. Kind of like Scripture speak, speaks about as a dog returns to his vomit. Speaking about uh, you know, a man returning to his old ways and his sin. And yet still in all of this, God kept his word, though they did not keep theirs. Isn't that a wonderful thing? That God, even when I am unfaithful to you, you are faithful to me. When I don't obey your word, you are faithful to me because you, are, because you keep your word, because you are God. It's amazing that God never changes. I may change, but God never changes. He changes not, it says in his word. Praise God that we have the Lord, the rock of our salvation that we can stand upon, that we can anchor ourselves to. It says in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 14, the backslider in heart will be filled with his own ways, but a good man will be satisfied from what? His multiple vacations, his thick paycheck, his big home, her, her large array of makeup and clothing. Uh, what, what is it that will satisfy a man or satisfy a woman? It's the Lord to be satisfied from above. But then we also read in Isaiah 44, verse 22. It says, I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions, and like a cloud your sins. Blotted them out. Just gone. Just dealt with. And it says, return to me, for I have redeemed you. Return to me. Each and every one of us has to beware of a backslidden heart. Each and every one of us, you want to fear something? That's something to fear, your flesh. Because a backslidden heart, it's the flesh in us that, that man, just little by little, like that song goes from Casting Crowns, I believe it is, it's a slow fade when you, I think it's give yourself away, am I right? When it's a slow fade. It's just little by little by little by little. It's kind of like the waters coming in and just slowly eroding the shore. And you might not notice it if you go there every day or every week or every month or even every year, but over the course of the years, over the course of the decades that go by, and you look at this picture and you look at that picture and like, whoa, what happened? But it happened little by little. It's that slow fade, you see. And what is that slow fade? That is indicative of going backwards. That's backslid, going backwards in one's walk with God and God's word to 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 the people are, come back to me. Draw near to me, he says in his word, and I will draw near to you. God does not move. Sometimes God's people move. We take a step back, but God doesn't. 
He's always there. And when we hopefully, prayerfully come back to our senses and recognize that the the Lord is good, we recognize that, Lord, you never left me. You've been here all along. You've been here all along in my hurt. You've been here all along in my sin. You've been here all along when I have transgressed your ways. You've been here all along because God is so faithful. You know, we may not even be here for one another. We certainly can't be here for one another in the same manner that God can. But we can always know that God is here for us. And I want to encourage you in this today, folks. Do know that with the Lord, you are never alone. You are never, ever, ever alone. I'll share something with you, just briefly. It blows my mind how at times, and maybe you've been there before, you can be in a room, like on Sunday mornings, right? We're packing out the, the church in here and packing out the children's ministry and everything else. And we're, we're full, and, and, and you can be in a room just full of people, and yet you can still be alone. Have you ever been in that place? Oh, I have. I have been in that place one too many times. Yet there's people all around. They might even be talking with me, having conversation with me, and I feel so hollow and so alone. You see, and I've also had times, more than not, that there's nobody around me. Family is out of the house doing their thing. Maybe Kathy's out of town, whatever it might be. And I am physically alone from my family or from being out in public or whatever it might be. And yet I recognize that I am so surrounded. So surrounded and so filled by the presence and the Holy Spirit of God, and I'm not alone at all. You see, the reality is, is it doesn't have anything to do with the people in or not in our lives. It has everything to do with our heart's position before God. Our heart's position before God. So we see here, and we'll continue next week when we pick up in verse 18, the people are recalling that he is the God of all glory and that he is the God of all goodness. It says that they were, that they they see, they notice, they're, they're recalling the goodness of God in their lives. God's provision, but not only God's provisions, because God's goodness goes beyond far beyond his provisions for us. It goes of his very presence. It speaks of his very presence in our lives. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we do just continue to give you thanks tonight, Lord God. We thank you that you are so, so good, O Lord, so good to us. And Lord, we don't deserve the goodness of God in our lives. But you give it to us, Lord. You give it to us, Lord. Because your word says that God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son, Lord. You've given given your only begotten son for us. That's what love does. Love gives. And Lord, love gives sacrificially. That's what love is. It's not an ooey-gooey feeling. It's not the goosebumps on my my, uh, arms. That's not love. Love is sacrificial. Love is a word that is action. Love is something that is demonstrated. Love is what you have given to me and you have shown to us. And Lord, may we, we, each of us, respond.